So thank you everyone very much for joining us today, both here on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, for those of us new to us, Autistica is the UK's autism research charity, and we exist to create breakthroughs that enable every autistic person to live a happy, healthy, long life. We fund research and we shape policy and work with autistic people to understand their needs. And we also work in partnership with others to ensure that research really changes. A big part of that is sharing the latest research and the latest evidence-based practice, which is what these webinar series is all about. So I'm Bethan, I'm Engagement and Events Manager Autistica, and I'm really looking forward to this webinar, which is all about looking at ADHD, especially as a common kind of co-occurring condition of autism. And we found you know, more and more people talking about getting one diagnosis and then getting the second. Um, and this is why I've got Emma here to speak to you. So Emma is very kindly joining us. She is the Director of the Neurodiversity Early Service at the ADHD Foundation. Emma's role is to work alongside early years settings, parents and carers of children in the early years and young children, presenting emerging traits in neurodevelopmental conditions. Alongside leading on early years service, Emma works as part of the national training health team, providing professional development, training and coaching in areas such as mental health, education, behaviour support. Um, and we're doubly pleased to have Emma here because Emma's part of the ADHD Foundation and both Autistica and the ADHD Foundation are proud to be members of the Embracing Complexity Coalition. So Embracing Complexity brings together organisations working to improve the lives of people with neurodevelopmental conditions. So working together rather than each diagnosis working separately. So with that, I will hand over to Emma. Great, thank you, Bethan. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, everybody. It's lovely to see that we've got lots of you attending today's session. As Bethan kindly introduced, my name's Emma Weaver. I work for the ADHD Foundation. We are based up here in Liverpool. And actually, look out the window today. Liverpool is very grey and a little bit wet at the moment. Um, I hope you've got a kind of sunnier outlook uh, where you are. Uh, thank you for joining today. We're going to be exploring ADHD. I'm going to talk to you a little bit around what ADHD is, how it presents, and then I'm going to talk about some strategies and things that we might want to think about when it comes to supporting either your children. So if you are a parent of a child with potential ADHD or a diagnosis of condition, or if you yourself as an adult are maybe here because you are, you have thoughts or you are recognising that maybe some of the traits relate to you. Um, and actually are in line with maybe um, maybe where you are sitting within that neurodiverse kind of profile. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about things that we can do to support ourselves when it comes to planning, organising, self-regulation, um, and I suppose making sense of, of the, the ADHD world as well. So it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour. We've got 35 minutes and it's a big topic to cover in 35 minutes, but please feel free to ask any questions. Um, I'd love to hear from you and answer the questions at the end of the presentation. You can also find out more information about us um, on our website. The website has been popped in the chat box there for you, but we're also on Twitter and we're on Facebook. So please feel free to follow us. We've got lots and lots of information and further reading for you on there. So let's get started. Now, I wanted to start by introducing you to a term that we're hearing a lot more of, of it now. Um, and actually, it's a really good thing with the term is neurodiversity. It might be new to some of you or it might be something that you're particularly familiar with. But neurodiversity is, is a bit of a movement that we are finding ourselves part of. It's a strengths based approach to, um, I suppose, celebrating the strengths of those people with neurodevelopmental conditions. Now, when we talk about neurodevelopmental conditions, we're talking about autistic spectrum condition, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, and they all fit under the umbrella of neurodiverse um, people. You might hear the term neurodivergent. Um, I quite I much prefer the term neurodiverse because I feel like neurodivergent is kind of creating a bit of a separation there. But what we like is is the idea that we're celebrating the strengths of people with neurodevelopmental conditions, recognizing the challenges, but also looking at what the contributions are from from our people uh, in society with uh, neurodiverse needs. So we know that one in five human beings are neurodiverse. Neurodiverse minds are a part of human diversity and something that we actively promote within the ADHD Foundation is that they're not errors of genetics or a disorder 
sets. They're just simply different ways of working. It's different ways of thinking. The team here at the ADHD Foundation, lots of us are diagnosed with neurodevelopmental conditions. And actually that's been a huge asset to us as a team, as we're able to see kind of the perspective of other people because we've had the experience ourselves, or we're able to see things and view things in a different way and a different way of working, which has certainly helped us to develop and to grow even further. Now, when we talk about neurodiversity and when we talk particularly about neurodevelopmental conditions, we're often talking about the co-occurrence of these conditions. We know, and the research time and time again now, particularly in the last kind of few years, we are being told that co-occurrence is, is more common than not. So actually it's really, really likely that if you are diagnosed with one neurodevelopmental condition, you are a higher likelihood of having another one. So they often run hand in hand. So if you are a person attending stay session and you are diagnosed as on the autistic spectrum, there is potential that, you, that there, is, there are other neurodiverse needs for you. And these are just some statistics. And these statistics have come from a very wonderful lady. She's our chair of our board. Her name's Professor Amanda Kirby. She um, has, a, has a company that's called Do It Profiler, but she's a professor at Cardiff University who just does lots and lots around um, understanding neurodiverse needs. She looks a lot into co-occurrence and, she and she's developed lots of research for us to develop our understanding further. And this kind of research has come from, from uh, Professor Amanda Kirby. So four in five people with ASD are also likely to have developmental coordination disorder. So that's dyspraxia. Up to one in two people with developmental coordination disorder are likely to have ADHD. One in two people with ADHD are likely to have tic disorder, otherwise known as Tourette's to some people. One in five people with tic disorder are likely to have developmental language disorder. One in four with DLD might have uh, language and development disorders or learning difficulties. One in six with learning difficulties may also have dyslexia. One in two with dyslexia may also have, uh, have dyscalculia. So basically what happens when it comes to neurodevelopmental conditions is that we are likely to be experiencing one or more or a few of the conditions. And that's why it's really important for us to hold that in mind when we're thinking about our own traits and our own experiences. Now, this is another slide from uh, uh, Professor Amanda Kirby. And the way that she explains it, and I really, really like this, is that for some people, they might be a sub threshold. So if you picture threshold as being where a person sits, and if you are, um, if you have a diagnosable condition where the traits are significant enough that you have been referred, that you have seen a doctor, a psychiatrist or a pediatrician as a child, your traits are significant enough that you receive a diagnosis. So if we were to use ADHD as an example, the traits are significant enough, the person's gone along to the doctors or to the pediatrician and they've received the diagnosis. Now that means that they are past threshold, so they've met the threshold. But what uh, Professor Amanda Kirby say, says is that actually there are lots and lots of people who have co-occurring sub-threshold conditions. And sub-threshold is that potentially their traits aren't significant enough for a diagnosis. So it might be that there are sub-threshold traits of dyslexia for you. It might be that you have difficulties with your reading and writing, but they're not significant enough where you've been and received that identifier for it. Your child might have um, post-threshold, so threshold ADHD, they've had the diagnosis, but actually you're seeing some other traits there of potentially autistic spectrum condition. You might be seeing dyslexia. We know that 40% of people with ADHD have co-occurring dyslexia as well. So the, so the likelihood of there being other co-occurring conditions is really, really high. And what we've got to be mindful of and what we've got to, I suppose, think about is that just because we have a diagnosis of one doesn't mean that those difficulties within the other um, spectrum conditions aren't there for us. So that we need to be seeing it more as a neurodiverse profile rather than these standalone diagnoses. And I think over time, we're going to get there. We're going to get to the point where we refer to it as the neurodiversity profile. But at the moment, we're still very much in that kind of um, diagnostic framework where it's we are diagnosed with either or or something else. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention today because we are talking about that symptom overlap. So I want to talk specifically about ADHD. 
ask. Now, we are the ADHD Foundation, but we are the neurodiversity charity. We are the largest charity um, in the UK, which focuses on neurodiverse needs. And something that uh, we talk about frequently is the, uh, the stigma attached to ADHD in particular, but the stigma that's attached to quite a few of our neurodevelopmental conditions. But we find with ADHD that sometimes the terminology can appear quite negative. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Now, when we think about ADHD, we typically think about uh, boys a lot of the time. We typically think about young boys who are really struggling with their um, impulse control. They're struggling to concentrate. They're struggling to sit still um, over sustained periods of time. ADHD isn't just hyperactivity. You can have hyperactivity to have ADHD, but not all people will experience that, particularly our females with ADHD. Hyperactivity for them might not necessarily be lots of movement and lots of wiggling about, but actually it might be um, uh, constant chatter or busy minds. I work with lots and lots of adults, parents in particular, and it, it might be the mum of a child that's coming through the diagnostic pathway, is recognising some of the traits in herself. And when we discuss it, we're seeing high levels of anxiety. She, one mum in particular explained it to me as she just feels like her mind runs away with her. Now, that's a typical presentation for our females with ADHD. So we need to hold that in mind that people with ADHD will present differently and people's traits are unique to the individual. So ADHD, um, it stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Sadly, we've got that term deficit in there. Deficit makes it sound like we're lacking in something. It's not the case at all. We need to see ADHD as a dysregulation of, of certain areas of learning, certain areas of interaction, certain areas of self-regulation. It's not that a person with ADHD can't, it's just that sometimes they need support or they, or they uh, need opportunities to regulate what's happening for them. So regulate the, the distractors in the environment in order to be able to manage them, regulate their emotions and their, their big feelings in order to regulate and monitor their behaviour. And then we've got that final word, which is disorder. Again, not a very nice one. We're hoping that we do move away from that term and that we look more towards the condition. Autistic spectrum condition has gone through that. Um, and lots of people do refer to autism as the autistic spectrum condition now. Kind of hoping that ADHD gets there at some point as well. And um, just in order to kind of so that we're recognising and we're celebrating the strengths of people um, with ADHD. Now, ADHD is very centered in neuroscience. Neuro is brain. Neuroscience is the science of the brain. Any neurodevelopmental conditions are related to the way that the brain has developed. Now, my role in early years, I'm constantly talking about early, early, um, early stages of brain development. But the bit that's particularly interesting when we focus on ADHD is it's the prefrontal cortex. So it's the part of the brain that's at the very, very front. It's here. And the prefrontal cortex in a person with ADHD is less well developed. So it's smaller, it's less mature in its development, which leads to a developmental delay. Now, the developmental delay is often in attentional control, in regulating behaviours, and for some individuals, in delays in social communication um, abilities as well. Now, we know at primary school level, that delay is typically two to three years. So for our children at primary, they might be eight chronologically, but actually developmentally, they might be functioning a lot younger. And we need to hold that in mind because when we think about our strategies, we've got to think about our strategies from a developmental perspective, not necessarily a chronological perspective. Now, what happens is that ga gap, unfortunately, gets slightly bigger in our secondary years. So our teenagers developmentally are typically three to five years behind their peers. Now, what happens in human brain growth and development is that the brain continues to mature up until the age of 25. Any of you that are on this um, on this webinar today who are over the age of 25, unfortunately, it's not that it's downhill, but the brain has kind of gone through its stages of growth, which means that ADHD doesn't disappear. But what happens is the brain has had its opportunity to develop and grow as much as as much as it can. Uh, which means that also that person is hopefully with the right intervention, the right support, which is why early intervention and early identification is, is key. Hopefully that person's developed coping strategies and ways to regulate their, their difficulties with their traits and their, and their condition, the, the condition of ADHD.
Now, what happens is we have a series of neurotransmitters in the brain. These neurotransmitters basically send information around the brain and around the rest of the body. There are two neurotransmitters that are particularly important with ADHD. One is called dopamine and one is called noradrenaline. People with ADHD have a dysregulation of those neurotransmitters. The only way that I can kind of try to make sense of it myself is when I think about people who have diabetes. If they have low blood sugars or their insulin levels need regulating, they will go and gain something in order to regulate those levels. So they might go and get a Mars bar. They might need to go, if they're type one diabetic, they might need to go and have, a, have, a, have an injection to regulate themselves again. Dopamine is the same. The difference between the two is that it's movement that increases dopamine. The more we move, the more likely it is that we can regulate our dopamine. So that's why people with ADHD move. And it's really important that they do because movement increases those neurotransmitters that are needed for us to function, for the prefrontal cortex to do its job. And I'm gonna to talk to you about executive functions, which are a significant part of ADHD. Now, I just wanted to show you just very quickly this video. Um, it's from Flynn Farmer. You can get hold of the video on YouTube. It's just called The ADHD Brain by Flynn Farmer. And it just gives you a bit of an idea and a bit of a further understanding of what happens in the brain of a person with ADHD. Our brain has a huge number of nerve cells. It is estimated that there are about 100 billion nerve cells inside our brain. 15 times the number of people living on planet Earth. Nerve cells all need to talk to each other to send messages to the rest of the body. The frontal lobe is the command center, just like the manager or boss of a large company. The messages from the frontal lobe and other parts of the brain go through complex networks of nerve cells. The nerve cells are connected to one another with a tiny space called a synapse. Let's call it a bridge. We need chemical messengers, neurotransmitters called dopamine and noradrenaline, to transfer messages from one nerve cell to another. Let's call them postmen. The postman would start from the first nerve cell, cross the bridge, knock at the door of the next nerve cell, and drop the letters, messages, through the letterbox. The same process continues to another nerve cell, and this is how messages travel around the body. This is called reuptake. In people who don't have ADHD, there is a good supply of postmen on the bridge, synapse, to continue to deliver letters. So the messages spread across the brain and around the body. ADHD can be caused by a number of factors. It is often inherited in our genes and is also influenced by the environment. The ADHD genes speed up recycling of the postman so that more postmen get back into the nerve cell. As a result, there are not enough postmen left on the bridge to deliver letters to the next nerve cell. This causes a chemical imbalance in the brain, disrupting the delivery of the message or letter. If you don't get clear messages from the frontal lobe, the boss, you can end up with chaotic behaviors such as reduced ability to stay still, reduced attention, poorer planning, disorganization, and acting without thinking. This would result in common ADHD symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. There are two different types of medication for ADHD called stimulants and non-stimulants. After you take your medication, it travels to the bridges between the nerve cells. Once on the bridge, the medication helps to stop the postman getting back into the nerve cell. Reuptake. This increases the number of postmen on the bridge able to deliver letters, and this is how the chemical imbalance may be improved by the medicines. Once the messages, letters, are transferred correctly and regularly across the bridges, your ADHD symptoms will improve, helping you control any hyperactive and impulsive behavior and to pay more attention. 
I hope that that video was helpful for you. It does talk about medication there, and medication is obviously a treatment option for ADHD, but not for everybody. Um, and if you are a parent, uh, it is parental choice. If you are an adult, it is your own choice as well. There are lots of lifestyle changes, including dietary changes, exercise um, changes, and things like that that can also support. There's also lots of research about omega-3 and omega-6, uh, which, which can be worth a read as well. But basically, what that video is kind of uh, pointing to is the traits of of ADHD and what's happening in the human brain which leads to those traits. Now the first trait and like I said earlier on we don't have to have all three of the traits of ADHD to be diagnosed with it so it might be that you're sitting here thinking oh that's not really me but then we'll look at the second one and you'll think oh yeah actually I'm seeing more of that. Now the first trait is inattention. If you are inattentive we call it working memory. It can often be difficult for you to store information on the go. So if you're an adult, it might be that you find that you um, can be forgetful at times or that you somebody will give you a verbal instruction. You'll go off in the direction in order to do, do what's been asked of you, but on the way you've forgotten. Now, we all have lapses in our working memory. It's really common, particularly when we're stressed with age as well. We can have lapses in that working memory. But for a person with ADHD, it's on a consistent kind of regular basis. So what we tend to find is that they might fail to follow our instructions. Children, the children that I meet and that I work with, we sometimes find that they make repeated mistakes over and over again. So they learn something at school. It comes to kind of completing that activity the next day and it's like it's it's completely um, forgotten. I was with a child in year two. They'd learned their two times tables. They were doing really, really well with their two times tables. It came to the week after and they'd completely forgotten it. It's that storing of information. For a long time, a horrible term, but ADHD was referred to as sluggish cognitive tempo. Horrible, horrible word. But it's basically the idea that processing speed for some people can be a little bit slower. So sometimes, and we call it the 15 second rule, is when we give a person with ADHD a verbal instruction, just give them time to process it. Count in your mind 15 seconds before you expect a response from them. Because it might be that it's just taken them that little bit longer to store the information. But what we tend to find in our adults with ADHD is that they might they might be the adult that's forgetful or forgetting things. You know, our team, we're losing laptops and, and phones and car keys and all sorts. And actually that relating that to inattention, that's the ability to be able to re retain and remember things on the go whilst you're busy, whilst your mind's busy. You've then got the second trait, which is hyperactivity. Hyperactivity is different in different people. For some, it's particularly our, our women with ADHD, like I said earlier, it might be chatter, it might be busy minds. Um, for boys or for, for other females as well, it's boundless energy, constantly on the go. You might see sleep difficulties. In school, what we see is children really struggling at times when they're, when they're meant to be sitting still, carpet times, during learning times. It's just that constant need for movement. Look, meal times at home can be really tricky because the child just wants to be on the go. If you're an adult in the workplace, you might be finding it really, really difficult to sit behind your desk for long periods of time. You might find actually you've found work um, that suits you best. It might be that you work outside and you're moving around all the time. I know that my job in and out of schools, standing up and doing presentations as part of the training team suits me because I need to move. Working from home, sitting behind a desk during lockdown was a nightmare for me because I need to move in order to keep concentration but also to feel good as well it's really important movement increases dopamine the more we move the better we're going to feel and then you've got the final trait which is impulsivity now impulsivity basically is behaving before thinking so the way that that might look, it might be somebody that speaks before they've thought about it. So you might find that you get yourselves into some tricky situations. A thought comes into your mind and you've got to say it, because if you don't say it in that moment, you forget. Um, I've, I work with lots and lots of adults who say, will say, say, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you, but I've got to say it now because if I don't say it, I'll forget it which is why writing things down, making notes is really important. Impulsivity might also be risk-taking behaviours. Now that's in our children and in our adults. It might be that, uh, you know, behaving before thinking means that we don't always think about the risk or the consequences of the behaviour. 
We also might find that in our, for our younger children, they're really struggling to wait their turn, to take turns and to share. We sometimes find that the um, impulsive part of ADHD is often quite competitive. Now, this is great in education in particular, because I find our impulsive children are our most engaged. They're the ones that got the hands off. They're the ones that want to answer the questions first and be the first to respond. The challenge with that is that if they're doing it all the time, the social challenges centered around that. It's really important and something we're talking about all the time is that we don't stop that engagement and that excitement. It's about finding strategies and ways to manage that so that the child feels heard, but that those social difficulties aren't happening for them. Now, we know that there are three subtypes of ADHD. So like I said, you don't have to have all traits, all three to be diagnosed. We now know that there is subtype one which is the predominantly hyperactive impulsive. These are our children that I see in classrooms all the time that are up, moving around, appear to not be listening to us. I have parents that say to me, I know he's listening, but it looks like he's not. And actually, majority of the time, they are paying attention. They just need that movement in order to do that. But it can look obstructive. I worked with one little boy, and I'll never forget him. He used to walk around the classroom, touching everything, uh, pulling tables, pulling chairs out of the way. But the minute I would ask him what I just said, he would be able to repeat it back to me like that. So the attentional control was there. It was the hyperactive impulsive um, traits that he, he was particularly experiencing. You've then got the predominantly inattentive subtype. Now that's a person with few hyperactive or impulsive traits, but particularly struggling with attentional control. So being able to sustain attention, being able to remember and store information might be really difficult. They might not be demonstrating those busy movements or that excessive talking within the classroom or within the work environment. They're conforming to what's happening within the environment. But what we might find is that they're not retaining, they're not storing information. It might be the adults, it might be you, it might be an adult that you're supporting or that you live with or that's in your family that you know that you have to repeatedly give them a set of instructions or if you write the instruction down they're more likely to do it we call it externalize what's not happening internally if i'm not storing it in my memory put it on a piece of paper and it'll store because it's there and it's concrete and then you've got the combined the combined subtype is where you've got all of them kind of involved but what we know is that with through all the subtypes, there is a, a kind of core symptom of emotional dysregulation. So a difficulty with regulating our emotions and our big feelings. When we have difficulties with regulating our emotions and our, fe our big feelings, what we might find is as adults and as children, our emotions are very up and down. That actually, we need lots of support around managing our big feelings. I work with lots of parents that will become very, very upset very, very quickly or very angry very quickly or overexcited very quickly. What we tend to find with people with ADHD is they experience their emotions to a bigger extent, to it, to an extreme, which is why it's really important that we start young in developing skills in emotional self-regulation. My job in the early years is constantly talking to teachers, to parents, to early years practitioners around getting that early intervention in, around learning to control, understand and regulate your emotions. Now, ADHD has got some amazing kind of, uh, you might call it a superpower, you might call it ability, um, but we call it, and the technical term is hyperfocus. People who hyperfocus have the ability to pay significant attention to something that they are motivated by. Dopamine is our reward neurotransmitter. It's increased by movement, but it's also increased when we do something that we enjoy. So if you're a parent of a child at home and you're querying ADHD and school is saying that they're not sitting still, that they're shouting out during lessons, that they're struggling to regulate their emotions, but you're seeing them at home watching Star Wars or playing on, on um, Grand Theft Auto or on Roblox or uh, one of the games and they can sit for hours on end. That's hyperfocus. That's the ability to focus on something that motivates you. If you're motivated by it, your dopamine will rush and you are able to pay, to pay attention to it. Lots of adults with ADHD can be classed as workaholics. If they love what they do, we will see adults with ADHD working until three, four, five o'clock in the morning because they are in hyperfocus mode. It can be great, but it can also be really challenging because it can sometimes get in the way of daily routines. But this is a video to demonstrate hyperfocus. This is a study that happened in Florida. The same boy 
One, um, one of the videos on the left is him doing a maths challenge. The other one on the right is him watching Star Wars. Star Wars is his motivator. This is a silent video, so if the sound goes off, don't worry, but just look at the difference. One of my favorite videos. One of my favorite videos for lots of reasons. One, demonstrating the need for movement. So this boy on the maths challenge was doing all of that movement to, in order to do his best to concentrate. Personally, I wouldn't give a child uh, a, a chair with wheels and that you can spin on, especially if they need to move because often that is a massive distractor, but there are strategies that you can put in place. We use resistance bands in our schools, lots. Resistance bands, you can tie them to the front two legs of the chair. Children put their feet inside and they kick underneath the desk. That's increasing movement for them. Adults that we support, adults in our team, we have stand-up desks. Stand-up desks are brilliant because that just that standing up is increasing your movement. So it's just about recognising the traits in your child or in yourself and working with those traits in order to support and to regulate um, those that, that dopamine. But what we know is that movement is key in everything that we do. Allowing for movement, whether it's gross motor skill movement, so getting out for a big long walk on your lunch break, or our children in schools will have movement breaks and movement opportunities. Or fine motor skill movement can be equally as important. This is where we talk about fidget toys. I work in some schools where they've got the soft side of Velcro underneath the tables so that the children can just fidget with it whilst they're listening to the input. I've got another school and they use blue tack and play-doh for the child to move and play with whilst they're concentrating that is an effective reasonable adjustment for a child who needs to move in order to learn now if we get that movement if dopamine's moving around the body and around the brain then our executive functions which are housed in the frontal lobe have um, a, a better chance of of being able to be put into into practice and into action now, our executive functions, we all have them. They develop in the early years, but we develop our executive functions as we mature. So we hone the skills. Now, there are eight different executive functions and they're listed on, on the screen in front of you. Now, in our early years and in our younger age groups, we wouldn't expect children to have all eight secured. By the time we reach adulthood, the expectation is that we have all eight in place. People with ADHD have a weakness with their executive functions. So it's a weakness with regulating their impulse control, weakness in regulating their emotions, being flexible with their thinking, so being able to change when routines change or when experiences change, storing information, monitoring themselves. So when they are concentrating, monitoring in order to maintain that focus, planning and prioritizing can be really tricky task initiation and organizational skills. So lots and lots of adults with ADHD need lots of support to get going with a task. Once they've started, they're okay, but in some instances they need support to get started. Some adults that we support have difficulties maintaining attentional control. We might find that there's short bursts of attention. Same with our children. Everybody's executive functions are unique to them. But what we know is across the board for people with ADHD, executive functions are gonna be a challenge. But there's lots that we can do in order to support that. Our go-to line at the ADHD Foundation is externalize what's not happening internally. Get it out on paper, get it up on the walls, get it visual for, for people with ADHD. Adults or teenagers can use things like checklists. So, you know, just having a list of the things that you need to do and ticking them off. That visual representation takes out of needing to be stored in here where the weakness is. Once it's on paper, it's concrete, I can see it and I can follow that as my plan. It helps me to plan and organize. We're in that technological age where we've got smartphones and smart watches. I've got teenage girls that have, um, uh, with one girl in particular, because of her weak um, working memory, she would find it really difficult to remember when she needed to go and change sanitary products. So she would set a, a timer 
So every hour and a half, she would get a buzz on her smartwatch, which would be her reminder to go and change her sanitary towel. Very, very simple steps, but really, really effective. We also know that people with ADHD can have difficulties with time awareness. So awareness of how long something's going to last for. So demonstrating time visually can be really helpful. You know, we've got um, in our office for our adults that struggle with that, we have countdown timers. So a countdown timer can be put on Teams. It can be put on, on um, any, we can send them as emails and it's just countdown timers to demonstrate when we've got 10 minutes left before five o'clock and we're all getting kicked out of the building. Same for our children with ADHD. Visual timers, the likes of sand timers. We use Time Timer, which is on, you can get it on online, on YouTube, but it's a visual representation that something's going to come to an end. Great when we're supporting transitions. You might want to use a visual timetable to demonstrate what the child is doing now, what they're doing next, and use a timer to demonstrate how long they're going to be doing that for. All of this is just externalizing those planning skills, but also externalizing those timekeeping skills as well and then final strategies and things that you might want to think about is developing skills in emotional self-regulation people who um, have adhd impulsivity can cause difficulties for them uh, when it comes to regulating how they feel but potentially regulating how they manage situations as well skills in self-regulation help us to manage impulse control but it also helps us to manage attentional control and our emotions. So the more opportunities we have to learn breathing techniques, relaxation strategies, stopping and thinking using mindfulness techniques really can be really, really helpful for the ADHD brain. And these are just some things that you might want to look into. For our young children, Stop, Breathe and Think Kids, brilliant app that you can get on the iPad. For um, all children and, and adults, I use it myself, square breathing, which is you find a square in any environment that you're in. Um, some people might want to use their phone and you just follow the outline of the square, breathing in as you go along the top, hold as you go down the side, breathe out as you go across the bottom and then hold again. You just follow the outline. You might want to do it around a window. You might want to have your, a square printed off and you follow that. But square breathing can be really helpful. For older people, monitoring your mood, having emotion journals can be really helpful. Reflect on how you're feeling. Reflect on what you did last time you were feeling like that in order to manage those emotions. Headspace, another brilliant app to support relaxation um, and learning breathing techniques. Yoga, particularly if you're somebody that needs lots of movement, that can be great for our very physical people with ADHD. And the Calm app is another um, lovely one that you can use and one that we would highly recommend. So I hope whistle stop tour and half an hour is not a very long time to talk. I'm conscious that there's lots of questions that have come in as well. But I hope that that's given you some information about what ADHD looks like, that there is a, an, a often a co-occurrence with other, co, uh, other neurodevelopmental conditions and that it rarely travels alone. And that for people with ADHD, all it is is a, a, is a recognition that movement is important and that opportunities to externalize what's not being stored internally will significantly help um, as a strategy in order to support people who are struggling with those executive functions. So I hope that's been helpful. And I think we're gonna move into um, answering some of your questions now as well. Brilliant, thank you so much for that, Emma. That was really interesting. And as you say, you fitted a lot into that 30 minutes, it really was. Right, we do have a fantastic number of questions coming in. Um, and just a reminder to people in the audience, we will be sharing recording of this, complete of the slides after, afterwards. So you will be able to access it kind of later on. Um, so let me have a look at the questions. Gosh, a lot of questions. Um, So one question we've had is talking about ASD in some kind of cases like CAMS or other children mental health kind of services. It's sometimes classed as a mental health disorder or mental health condition rather than something more neurological. Um, do you know why this is and is there a way to kind of combat this? I think when it comes to uh, diagnosing it as a mental health condition, we know it's a neurodevelopmental condition. There are comorbid mental health 
um, conditions that we see in people with ADHD and people with autism. So a person with ADHD can have a comorbid anxiety disorder. We actually know that people with neurodevelopmental conditions are at a higher likelihood of having co-occurring mental health difficulties. But, but ADHD is not a mental health diagnosis. Um, it's a neurodevelopmental diagnosis um, and it comes under that umbrella, um, not, not the mental health uh, umbrella. I think the crossover between CAMS and neurodevelopmental services is that CAMS role is to support mental health. And I suppose what, what we need to be clear is that um, actually people with ADHD, people with autistic spectrum conditions need the same level of support, but potentially from an AD, with an ADHD or autistic spectrum condition focus because we find that we use CBT based approaches in our therapeutic work at the foundation but they are specifically tailored to the traits and the needs of a person with ADHD or autism um, and it's just about having that understanding of the dual diagnosis in order to then be able to facilitate the therapeutic intervention um, for the person. Brilliant thank you Emma um, and could you say a bit more about how you differentiate between ADHD and ASD? in cases where they're not comorbid, where one is kind of below the threshold for diagnosis. So different examples there. Yeah, it can be a really difficult one to, to kind of see as, as separate, I suppose. What I tend to find in my work, particularly if children have that post, that threshold for ADHD, so they've received the diagnosis of ADHD, what I tend to find is once they are gaining support, whether that's medication or lifestyle changes, we then see the autistic traits becoming more apparent. So the way that that looks in some of our children might be that the social communicate. Initially, we thought that the social communication difficulties were centered around the impulsivity. So the impulsive behavior has led to the child finding it difficult to socially interact with other children, maybe because they are impulsive in their turn taking. So they find it difficult to share or that they um, intrude on other children's conversation or during conversation. Now, impulsivity and social communication difficulties are, are very separate. A social communication difficulty is um, more to do with the ability to, to communicate, to socialise with others. So what we tend to find is that the overlap can be difficult to pinpoint. What, in my experience of an ADHD, uh, aut ADHD autism um, co-occurrence is that we see once the ADHD is being managed through, through intervention or through medication, we start to see the challenges with sensory needs. We might also see an increase in the child's uh, kind of need for uh, routine and re that repetitive nature of autism. Our children with ADHD and comorbid autism, we might, be see we might be seeing traits similar to that as well in our children with ADHD. But it is a fine line and it can be really tricky. It's kind of a linking question. Obviously, autistic people, especially females, there's a lot of masking going on. Is that something you find in ADHD and does that kind of hinder diagnosis as well there? Absolutely. We are, particularly in our females with ADHD, our girls with ADHD often don't get diagnosed until a lot later. Um, we also tend to find that our girls with ADHD will go potentially down a mental health route to begin with. So we will be looking at them as teenagers and we'll be looking at them as suffering with um, anxiety disorders or um, difficulties with mood um, and, and mood difficulties as well. But actually, when we unpick and we look at diagnosis for ADHD, it's been ADHD all along. What we know is that the female brain is, is much more sociable. So girls do a really great job of mirroring what everybody else is doing. So girls with ADHD, girls on the autistic spectrum do a great job of kind of conforming to what everybody else is doing. When it comes to ADHD, and a classic example, I was doing an observation of a little girl in, in a classroom. She followed the instructions. She was sitting on the carpet. She was given the instructions. She got up, she moved to a table. She got the resources that she needed. But the minute she sat down and had to put pen to paper to get her thoughts and her learning down on paper, she wasn't able to do that. So what for this little girl, she did a great job of masking that she was storing because what she was doing was she was copying what everybody else was doing. So everybody else is sitting and looking. I will do the same. Everyone's now getting up. I'll do the same. Everyone's now going to their table. I'll do the same. But what she was struggling with was the, then the independent task that was needed. So that the, the masking took place um, from, from that perspective with that child. 
Thank you. And in regards to kind of later diagnosis, is there kind of any focus around kind of the test for ADHD and looking at that, but targeted to older adults, particularly those may know in autism, kind of anyone over 60 is quite a fight to get that diagnosis. What's that? Uh, and it's, it's similar with ADHD. We have something called the QB test. So at the ADHD Foundation up here in Liverpool, we have um, a private clinic um, where lots and we are seeing a, a huge amount of people coming for private diagnosis and we use something called a QB test and a, the QB test is a computerized program I'm actually sitting right now in the QB room which is where we do more QB testing um, and a, a, it's a computerized based program the adult will sit with an infrared camera on their forehead and they've got a clicker in their hand. A series of patterns come up on the screen when the same color and the same pattern come up the person has to click for our adults the QB tests last for 20 minutes for our children it lasts for 15 minutes and it helps us to monitor movement through the infrared um, on the on the forehead it also helps us to monitor inattention and hyperactivity through the clicking now you can access the uh, QB test up until the age of 60. After 60 it tends to be more related to um, observations clinical interviews um, a huge part of the QB test is also observation during the uh, QB test. So our psychologist will sit and will observe movement, observe interaction. And we also have a series of other questionnaires that are filled out before the QB test takes place. So it's a bit more of a holistic view of, of the person, not just the test that's done. Great, that sounds fascinating. Um, yeah, and we talked, you talked a bit about kind of comorbidity comorbid or co-occurring conditions for autism in ADHD, referring back to my wrong one. Um, what about physical health conditions? Do you find those kind of common physical health ones for ADHD as well? Yeah, there's been actually very, very recent research around autoimmune and inflammatory um, conditions related to ADHD and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, and very, very recent, as in the last year or so, there's been this new research that's come out, which is really interesting um, to, to read. Uh, we also see lots of, uh, and in our work, we see lots of people with the likes of fibromyalgia, um, or we also might see um, the likes of dyspraxia, um, or difficulties with uh, with coordination and with movement as well, which can lead to physical difficulties for people with ADHD. But if anybody's interested in, re in reading the article, if you just Google, and I can't remember off the top of my head who the researcher is, but if you just type in um, inflammatory conditions and ADHD, it will come up because it's actually, it's really interesting to, to, to read. Thank you. Um, and then about diagnosis, we've got a question here, which looks at, Kind of, if you think your child or yourself as an adult, we've got a question from both angles, have both autism and ADHD and you want to go forward for a diagnosis. Do you have any thoughts about how, if it's possible, how best to get it so you get diagnosed for both at once without that kind of separation delay? Yeah, the challenge is this, the two systems are separate, which makes it tricky. So if it's a child, it's through school, it's through education. So the school, SENCO, can make the referral. You can go to your GP. Um, up here in Liverpool, we tend to find it's the school referrals in particular. Um, can uh, we see the success with the school referrals? From an adult, um, an adult perspective, it's if you're going down the NHS route and you're not going down the private route, it would be going to your GP, and it's a referral to psychiatry. Adult psychiatry uh, would be the route that you would go down for for a diagnosis for for adults with ADHD. Now, unfortunately, the waiting lists, particularly for adults, um, are huge. We know that the average uh, wait time is seven years um, for an adult with ADHD, which is why we've got our private clinic, which is why, uh, you know, um, giving people other options in order to gain that diagnosis um, is, is something that we're really keen to do because that wait is, is very long. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's about seeking the support from the right agencies, really. Um, and if it's a child, it's through the Senko at school in particular. Um, and linking to that question from Facebook is they've got the diagnosis, but they find that their school is, or GP and school combined is really reluctant to provide, to kind of access any medication for their child. They're really focusing on other treatments, other help 
benefits. Is that something you found that there's kind of a reluctance around medication for younger children? It depends on the age of the child. It depends, children typically under the age of five um, don't have, don't receive ADHD medication. Typically, the, the diagnostic age typically is around six and seven anyway, but I've worked with some little ones who were diagnosed a lot earlier. Um, medication is a treatment option. Medication can be re a really successful treatment option for lots and lots of people. For others, it doesn't suit them. And it might be that it's medical history. It just might be like with lots of other medications, it's not right for them. Um, so I suppose it's, it's very, very individual to, to, to the child. I'd be asking the questions, I suppose, of the doctor and of school. What is the reluctance for medicating? Is there a medical reason for that? If there isn't a medical reason for that, why, uh, would they not be willing to trial medication to see how the child manages on medication? We have children that will trial it for a couple of months. If it works, great. If it's not working, then, then we look at other options. Brilliant. Um, completely different question here. And we've actually had it twice, but one looking at adult male prison population, another looking at school population, about kind of using kind of free time, outside time, playtime for children as almost a punishment. So those that are acting challenging or kind of difficult behaviour, often this is taken away as kind of punishment or way of controlling. Obviously, based on what you said, outside activity is so important for the controlling. Is there kind of what would your be tips, I guess, be to kind of combat that or kind of change people's view on that? Really difficult, Beth and my we are hugely against taking away those opportunities for our young people because actually it makes it harder for, for them. Something that we talk about regularly is we call we call it proactive and reactive strategies. So a reactive strategy is reacting to what's happened. So taking something away from the child, taking, you know, playtime or if we're thinking about the prison population, taking their outside time away from them. Actually, what we need to be doing with, for people with ADHD is having proactive strategies in place for them. So that's consistent approaches that allow them to regulate so that fingers crossed they don't get to the point where things need to be taken away from them and it's about educating them if it's adults in particular it's educating them in understanding their condition that actually as an adult with ADHD movement is really important for me so what I'm going to do is make sure that at least four times in my day I will get up and move whether that's in a small confined area whether that's in the outside outside space but also if we're thinking about prison population in particular, it's about supporting the uh, people working within the prisons as well uh, to understand the importance of that, that actually taking opportunities to move away from a person with ADHD is only gonna cause you a whole host of difficulties because that movement, lack of movement uh, leads to the dysregulation of dopamine, which leads to further difficulties for that person. So it's about thinking throughout the day, how do you allow for movement in a way that's acceptable within whatever kind of environment that you're in to and to support that person to regulate um as opposed to taking a, taking it away from them brilliant and that i'll do one final question which kind of leads on quite nicely to that so it's kind of supporting individuals with adhd who have challenging or dangerous to themselves other behavior Obviously, movement seems to be really crucial. Are there any other kind of ideas you have around supporting, supporting them, but also helping them to manage their own behaviour? For me, it's all rooted in, in self-regulation. So self-regulation, it's that managing impulse. So um, we manage impulse through learning independent self-regulation skills. So I would be recommending that we work with individuals with ADHD around developing strategies for self-regulation so strategies in when I'm feeling like this, I need to stop. We call it stop, think and do. So I need to stop. I need to take a moment and then I need to decide the action that I'm going to take. For our children, and we start this very young in our early year service, we use stop, think and do as a coaching strategy. So we will say to our kids, when we see an impulsive moment or, or, or an impulsive moment happened and we're too late, we will just say, let's stop. 
Let's have a think about what's just happened and let's be solution focused. It's not a behavior management strategy, it's a coaching strategy. For older children and adults, we do a lot of reflective work. So it's about um, when, if an impulsive moment's happened or a, or a behavior has happened and we're too late to catch it before it takes place, it's about reflecting on what happened. We use things like problem solvers, a problem solver was where you would sit with a person and you'd get them to write down what happened. You then get to them to think about what was their involvement in what happened and what was the consequence of their involvement for what happened and always link emotions to it. You then become solute, you take a solution focused approach. Had, had you have done something different or what could you have done differently in order to, to, for this situation to not have happened? You then talk about what would the consequence be had you have done something different and how would you feel about that? So again, it's another coaching stra strategy, but it's done on reflection. If you're in that situation again and you label the emotions at each point, when you were feeling hot or when you were feeling angry, why don't we try this next time? Maybe a breathing exercise, maybe doing something with resistance bands. I know that lots of our children in particular really benefit from having that stop moment with something physical to get that physical feeling out. That can be really, really helpful in preventing the need for them to then go and be physical with things within their environment. If they're having, um, I suppose we call them sensory diets for some people, we call them resistance work for others, depends on where you are. But having regular opportunities to just get that feedback going can be really helpful. So children that I work with will have four opportunities across every single day. It's part of their routine. It's part of their structure where they go and do heavy pressured activities. So where they go and our little ones will be pushing really heavy wheelbarrows across the outdoor space. I've got teenagers dangling from monkey bars and pulling themselves up ropes um, using resistance bands, but they do it in a structured way. So the body is getting the release that it needs. So they are less likely to have that built up feeling and then use that release in an inappropriate way, I suppose. Again, it's proactive rather than reactive. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Emma. And I think that's, yeah, we'll have to stop there. So I'm really sorry to everyone whose questions we weren't able to get over to Emma. Um, obviously, it's a huge topic to kind of squish into an hour. And I think we've yeah, fit in a lot of information. It's been very full. Um, we've got some links in the chat there. So we've got the link to the ADHD Foundation, so you can find a bit more about the work they and Emma do there, um, as well as a link to Embracing Complexity, which is the um, coalition that both ADHD Foundation and Autistica belong to. Um, you do have Autistica's donate page, so if you found this useful, um, obviously all the work we do at Autistica is funded by people like you, so please yeah, have a think about that. Um, you can also find out more by joining our network, um, which should also be in the chat. Um, and finally, there's a short feedback survey. So that's always helpful for us. It helps us kind of know what you'd like, what's good, what's less good. Um, so that's all there. So that is everything. Thank you very much again, Emma. It's been wonderful having you sharing everything with us. Thank um, you for having me. And goodbye, everyone. <laughs>